Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Hindustan Unilever Limited conference call for the results for September 14, 30th September 23. As a reminder, seven lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during this conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star one zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference to Mr. Ravi Shankar, Group Controller and Head of Investor Relations, and over to Mr. Thank you, Neerav. Good evening, all, and welcome to the conference call of Hindustan Unilever Limited. This evening, we will be covering the results for the quarter and half year ending 3rd September 2023. On the call with me is Rohit Java, our CEO and Managing Director, and Ritesh Tiwari, our CFO. We start the presentation with Rohit sharing an overview of the operating environment, our performance in the quarter, and our key focus areas. Ritesh will then cover our financial results in more detail and also share the near term outlook. Expect the prepared remarks to take about 20 to 25 minutes, uh, leaving us with ample time for Q&A. Before we get started with the presentation, I would like to draw your attention to the safe harbor statement included in the presentation for good order's sake. With that, over to you, Rohit. Thanks, Ravi. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to interact with all of you. Uh, let me first start before I begin the presentation to share a milestone that we've crossed recently. Completed 90 years of corporate existence on 17th of October. It's a testament to the strength of our business, dedication of our people, unwavering support of all our stakeholders, and our long held belief that what is good for India is good for HUL. It's indeed a proud moment for us to share with you. Starting now uh, with an overview of the operating environment, the demand trends in this quarter remain stable and were similar to last quarter. Market volumes grew in high single digits year on year. However, we need to be mindful that this came on a base period where volumes declined in single digits, and hence, cumulatively, over two year market volumes remain largely flat. Urban and within that modern trade, the large packs are leading growth for the FMCG market. On the other hand, rural demand remains subdued, with volumes continuing to decline marginally on a two year basis. Price growth in the market is tailing off as expected, with FMCG players continuing to pass on the benefit of lower input costs to consumers. This is reflected in a sequential reduction in market price growth with September quarter at 3% versus 8% in June quarter. Consumers are yet to experience deflation, which largely explains why the volume recovery is gradual. The other lens to look at is price growth over a three year period, which as you can see, is a substantial 25% increase. FNCG market continues to witness heightened competitive intensity. As we spoke during June quarter results, we're seeing the resurgence of small and regional pairs in select categories and price points, many of whom had vacated the market during the peak of inflation. For instance, when you look at tea or detergent bars, smaller players are growing significantly ahead of large players. We're also seeing a sharp increase in media intensity. Aggregate media deployment in our categories increased by over 20% versus the same period last year. In this challenging backdrop, we deliver a resilient performance in the quarter. We scaled a new milestone by crossing Rs. 15,000 crores quarterly turnover mark for the first time. Our underlying sales growth is 4% and the underlying volume growth about 2.5%. There is a margin at 24.6% improved, 130 basis points year on year. Profit after tax for exceptional items and EPS grew 12% and 4% respectively. Talking about market share performance, our growth was competitive with about 60% of our business winning value shares. We continue to win volume shares in more than 75% of the business, which is an important marker as we move from price led growth to a volume-led growth. There are certain pockets of our portfolio, primarily in the mass end, where we have seen a dip in our value market shares. However, on a sustained basis, we have been winning shares in large parts of our business, 
leading to significant corporate share gains over the last two years. Speaking about progress made on some of our key sustainability initiatives, as a part of our sustainability goals that we announced last year, we have net zero goals which aim to achieve zero emission in our operations by 2030 and across our value chain by 2039. We have been decarbonizing our own operations driven by the rapid adoption of clean energy in our factories. Nearly 100% of our electricity is from renewable sources and we have replaced fossil fuels, biofuels, for thermal energy. However, a large part of emissions comes from outside our operations through ingredients purchased from our suppliers. More than half of our scope free emissions is actually in the home care business value chain. With an aim to mobilize actions to achieve net zero, we hosted more than 100 representatives from our home care suppliers across the world in our first Clean Future India Summit. As part of the summit, we announced two major initiatives. First, world's first near zero carbon soda ash, a partnership with Triticorin, Alkali Chemicals and Fertilizers Limited. Second, the scale up of low carbon student silicate, a partnership with Sudarshan Silicate Private Limited. Talking about another initiative, you must be aware of our Shakti program, where we work with over 1.9 lakh women entrepreneurs to transform their lives and livelihoods. A couple of weeks back, I visited Kanjadapur, a village in South Bengal, where I met Paramita. She is one of our Shakti entrepreneurs. She has been associated with us for over 12 years. I was delighted to hear her proudly narrate her passion for sales, financial independence, and being able to provide for her family. She is an influencer in her own right. She also spoke about amplifying issues, nutrition awareness project, which we call Mera Portion, Mera Gaon. A reminder that she doesn't just sell mutual products in the hinterland, but she also serves as a beacon of social change and entrepreneurship in her community. Shakti entrepreneurs are upskilling, becoming digitally savvy, and restocking their products using our eb 2 b app Shikhar. We have now onboarded over 1 lakh Shakti entrepreneurs on the Shikhar app. Shakti continues to grow from strength to strength and is indeed a testament to our belief of doing well by doing good. As you're also aware, we were the first FMCG company which partnered with ONGC, made went live with a U shop a year back. We are further extending our partnership with ONGC, leveraging Shikhar with an intent to democratize e-commerce for small retailers. With the help of an integrated module in Shikhar called the Shikhar Seller App, Nehur Kirana stores can now go on live on ONDC seamlessly and sell the entire catalog of range of products online. This is now live in two cities, New Delhi and Bengaluru, covering about 60 outlets as a pilot and we will further be scaling it based on retailer feedback. Let me shift focus from the here and now to the longer term. I'm a big believer in the India story and opportunity. We are the fifth largest economy with a GDP of worth $3 trillion, growing at fast pace and well poised to become the third largest in a few years. The demographics also stack in our favor. 20% of the world's working population, over a billion, reside in India. 10 million get added every year to the workforce, giving us a huge demographic dividend. India is leading the digital revolution. The India stack is one of its kind digital scalable public infrastructure based on identity payments and consent-based data sharing. Just to give you the magnitude, we have more than 130 crore Aadhaar card holders. In the years to come, applications based on the digital infrastructure, such as ONDC for digital commerce, Dulip for logistics, Aishman Bharat for electronic health records, amongst others, will spur innovations and new growth. While in several other more developed nations, digitization is a privilege. In India, digitization has been democratized to reach even the grassroots levels with the initiatives such as Aadhaar, Jandan, Yojana, and Unified Payment Interface. All these factors augur very well for our FMCG industry. Offers a huge runway for growth. India's per capita FMCG consumption when compared to other similar economies is significantly low, and within that, rural is highly under-indexed. Penetration levels for many of our large categories are still very low. Humanization is bound to accelerate as India becomes more affluent, and more urban. The more affluent population is expected to double by 2027. Naturally, their per capita MCG consumption is much higher at about 1.5 to 2 times compared to national average. 
in this context, we are well placed to win. As India's largest FMCG company, we are well placed to lead this growth opportunity. Each of our three divisions by itself will be larger in size than most of them, the FMCG is country. Nine out of ten households in India use one of our products. We are proudly the market leader in more than 85% of our business. We have a wide and a resident portfolio of 50 plus brands, of which 19 brands clock more than 1,000 crores turnover annually. We reach about 3 million outlets directly, of which 2.3 million outlets are covered through our distributor network and the remaining by our Shakti entrepreneurs in the rural hinterlands. And our supply chain, one of the most complex, it also gives us a significant competitive edge. To give you a perspective, we manufacture and sell more than 65 billion units every year, which is about 45 units per Indian. That's the scale of our supply chain. We continue to be the employer of choice for many years in a row. And now if you look at our tax record in the last decade, we've added 33,000 crores offline to our turnover, going at a CAGR of 9%, well balanced between volume and price growth. We have improved our better margin by over 800 basis points from 15% to 23%. And a large part of this has come from our culture of savings and our driving optimization. Our net profit in the last decade grew at 10% CAGR. Clearly, we have a very strong business model, and our track record is reflective of that. That brings me to key thrusts. Let me now outline the key thrusts that will enable us to continue winning in the marketplace. Our core belief of what is good for India is good for HUL, and the integrated approach to sustainability remains unchanged. A lot of what we have already been doing has strengthened our business, and we'll continue to build on it while adapting changing consumer trends and shopping behaviors. Our first thrust is to grow the core, which includes the 19 large brands through product superiority and winning-led ex execution. Second, we have spoken about the opportunity to categories of the future through market development. We will do this through persuasive comms, communication, large-scale consumer contact programs, driving mental and physical reach, innovations, and formats of the future that will propel on premiumization. Third, we have a job to continue transforming parts of our portfolio through the on-trend demand spaces, especially in beauty and foods. Fourth, winning in channels of the future through brilliant execution and creating a tailored portfolio by leveraging our design for channel approach remains an important thrust. We will also need to structurally reset our cost base, which will help generate fuel to invest back in growing our business. For this end, we'll continue leveraging our net revenue management symphony programs to drive sa savings across all lines of the PNL. We will further sharpen our distinctive capabilities, doubling down on Vimy and digital, by deeply embedding sustainability in our business, by building a culture of innovation, agility, and intelligent risk taking to empower teams operating with an owner's mindset. These are, in summary, our focus areas for now as we evolve and sharpen our strategy for the next phase. I look forward to sharing more details with you, course. Now, let me hand over to Ritesh to cover our results in detail. Ritesh? <clears throat> Thank you, Roy, and good evening, everyone. Let me now take you through our quarter results in detail. Rohit covered the overall FMCG market context, which remains challenging. In this backdrop, we have delivered another quarter of resilient performance. Our underlying sales growth was 4%, but an underlying volume growth was 2%. Talking about our bottom line performance, the margin at 24.6% improved 130 BPS year on year. Profit after tax, before excess items at rupees 2,668 crore was up 12%. Net profit at rupees 2,770 crores increased 4% year on year. The quarter numbers include the benefit of a one-off credit we received due to favorable resolution of indirect tax litigation. This slide explains the impact of this credit. Excluding the one-off, our underlying sales growth would have been 3%, with underlying price growth being flat. 
that GA growth would have been 7% with net profit declining marginally year on year. From a segment perspective, the benefit is entirely in duty and pussy care. Talking about our margin performance, our gross margin improved 700 DPS year on year to 52% and is back to pre inflationary levels. The increase in competitive intensity, we have stepped up in investments by about 700 crore year on year to ensure our share of voice remains ahead of our share of market. This is a 420 BPS increase versus September quarter. We will continue to invest behind our brands, protect our competitive position, and ensure the long-term health of our business. Let me now look at performance across the three segments. Home care grew 3%, both beauty and personal care, and food and refreshment grew 4%. Margins in all three segments remain healthy with home care at 19%, BPC at 27%, and FNR at 19%. When it comes to underlying volume growth, the divergence in segment that we saw in June quarter continued. Both home care and PPC delivered mid-single-digit UVG, while FNR saw a mid-single-digit time primarily due to sustained input cost inflation in coffee and HFD categories. I will now click down to talk about performance in each segment. Starting with innovations in home care, Comfort expanded its range to intense fabric conditioner created specifically for sportswear. A new range of dishwashing liquid, Pure, was launched. It is a superior 100% plant-based protein and phosphate-free formulation. Leveraging Vimy, Vim Liquid was relaunched with an improved formulation to suit varying needs of consumers. Moving on to home care performance in the quarter, the business grew 3% on a high base of 34% in SQ22. Volumes grew in single digit led by strong performance in both fabric wash and household care. Our premium portfolio in fabric wash continued to outperform with both surf and comfort growing volumes in double digits. Household care delivered high single digit volume growth in by dishwash. We have taken further price reductions in both fabric wash and household care to pass on the benefits of in low input costs. A and P investments has been set up to protect our competitive position. Now talking about beauty and personal care, this has been a busy quarter for our BPC team with launch of several innovations. These actions reflect the key thrust that Rohit spoke about earlier. We are transforming our skincare portfolio to innovations in evolving and on-trend demand spaces. Pons has extended its moisturizer range to build a hydration regime, which includes a cleanser, gel moisturizer, night gel, and a serum. Building on its strong Ayurvedic credentials, Indulekha has launched a new anti-dandruff hair oil and shampoo. Vaseline has introduced a new range of premium moisturizers for rich sensorial experience. LACME has introduced new literati correction for the upcoming festival and wedding season. LACME also launched iconic pro brush liner in ten format. Moving on to our performance in beauty and personal care, we delivered a volume-led mid-single-digit growth. Skin cleansing grew volumes in low single-digit, both Lux and Hamam continue to outperform. Body wash continues to scale up well. Hair care saw high single-digit growth led by Clinic Plus, Silk, and Indulekha. Future formats such as serums and masks continue to do well. Skin care and color cosmetics grew in double-digit with robust performance in Vaseline and Pons. Our focus interventions in new demand spaces such as hydration, sun protect, and in channels of the future, including e-commerce, is helping us drive growth. Oral care delivered mid-single digit growth led by close-up. Now talking about innovations and activations in FNR, let me start with bottom half of the chart. What you see is an innovative billboard by Taj Mahal. It uses raindrops that fall on the billboard to generate Indian classical music. It has won a Guinness World Record for being the world's largest environmentally active billboard. We have launched an exclusive range of artisanal ice cream called Slow Churn Ice Cream. It is made with 100% fresh cream and real fruit and is available in the e-commerce channel. I would strongly recommend you to try it. My favorite is Guava. We have extended our Horlicks Plus range with two new variants, Strength Plus for adults and Growth Plus for children in select geographies and channels. 
Hollis Bharati Bharosa campaign is focused on higher immunity benefits. Lipton Green Tea was relaunched in the quarter with a better tasting blend. Talking about performance in the quarter, FNR is seeing divergent input cost trend when compared to home care or BPC. We continue to see inflation in this business and have therefore taken judicious price increases to offset the impact of inflation. E saw modest growth, category continued to witness consumer downgrading. Coffee delivered double digit growth driven by pricing. Health food drinks delivered to mid six digit price led growth. I will spend some more time on HFD performance in the subsequent slide. Foods and ice cream both grew in mid single digit on a high base. Unis, as well as peanut butter, continues to see strong consumer traction and food solutions remain resilient with double digit growth momentum. Now, in this chart, let me cover HFD performance in a bit more detail. <clears throat> it has been a little over three years since we acquired the business. HFD is an underpenetrated category. Hence, our focus has been on recruiting consumers into the category. Through access packs, focused communication, increased distribution coverage, and doubling down on home to home connects, we have been able to handsomely grow penetration in this category, which was relatively stagnant for many years prior to the acquisition. We have also further strengthened our market share in the category. While recruitment of new consumers into the category has been healthy, consumption across existing users has declined over the last few years. The category was initially impacted by COVID and recently by high inflation as that of milk. High milk prices create a double whammy for HFD. Not only it is an ingredient in the production of HFD, but typically the product is consumed with milk. Hence, the increased cost of Horlicks and Boost saw a significant increase in past few quarters. Let me also cover in some detail what is happening on cost synergies and margin. As far as margins are concerned, we have seen two impacts. One is the inflation that I spoke about. Secondly, due to the planned strategic interventions of excess pack and sachets, we have had adverse effects. When it comes to cost synergies, we have unlocked most of the planned synergies with some more expected to come from manufacturing efficiencies over the next two to three years. These synergies have provided us the fuel for growth, invest in growing the business and counting the impact of inflation. Consequently, the EBITDA margin for the business remains what it was at the time of acquisition despite the significant inflationary cost. Now, I would like to use this opportunity to clarify a question which comes up in some of our discussion. You will recall that we had mentioned an underlying EBITDA of 31% for the business at the time of acquisition. I would like to remind you that this number includes the benefit of the consignment selling arrangement for the OTC products of Helion, which we had announced earlier, and it's effective November 23. The income from this business was more than 300 crores in the last season. With that being the context, our single-minded focus on market development remains unchanged. We want to bring in more users into the category while creating more occasions for consumption and minimizing our portfolio. We are driving three main actions to achieve this. We have sharpened our proposition to focus on outcome-based claims and owning occasions like monsoons. Transferring our science back credentials to recruit new users and at the same time premiumizing our portfolio. For instance, our plus range focuses on specialized nutrition requirements to address various lifestyle stages and conditions. And third, expanding our portfolio to new demand spaces like Mother Plus or the new millet based chocolate horlicks to future proof the portfolio. If we remain confident about the long term prospects of the category and in our ability to unlock volume led growth through market development. Of course, as we have said before, market development takes time and one needs to stay the course for long term value creation. Moving on, let me quickly summarize our performance for this quarter. Let me reiterate what Rohit said. We are delighted that we have crossed 15,000 crore quarterly turnover mark for the first time. This is truly a testament to the strength of brands and execution prowess of Hindustan Unilever. I have already taken you through most of the lines, but here let me explain the movement from 9% EBIT growth to 4% net profit growth in the next slide. Net finance income has benefited from better treasury yields, higher cash balance, and dividend received from subsidiaries. When it comes to the tax line, there are two impacts. 
As we had mentioned earlier, we expect regular ETR for the year to be about 26.5% versus the 26% that we had in the last fiscal. This has an adverse 1% impact on net profit growth. Further, we had substantial gains from prior period tax adjustments in SQ22 as three past year assessments were concluded. Since we are lapping this, we have an adverse impact of 9% on net profit for the quarter. Lastly, net exceptional cost was marginally lower year on year, giving a 1% benefit. Hopefully, this explains you a better understanding of the movement between profit lines. Moving on to our first half performance, our turnover is shy of 20,000 crore mark to 5% year on year. EBITDA margin at 24.1% increased 90 BPS. Add BEI and net profit grew 11% and 6% respectively. Considering our resilient performance in the first half of the year, the Board of Directors have declared an interim dividend of Rs. 18 per share for the year ended 31st of March 2024. This is a 6% increase compared to the interim dividend of last year. Let me now turn to outlook. Looking ahead, in the near term, we remain cautiously optimistic. Operating inflation and upcoming festive season should improve consumer sentiment. At the same time, we need to be watchful of heightened competitive intensity, volatile global commodity prices, as well as the impact of uneven monsoon on crop output and reserve levels. Overall, we, ex we expect volume recovery to remain gradual. If commodity prices remain where they are, we expect our price growth to be marginally negative. Our focus remains on driving competitive volume growth, stepping up investments behind our brands, and maintaining a better margin in a healthy range. We will continue to manage our business with agility and take actions to ensure long-term 4G growth, both which is consistent, competitive, profitable, and responsible. With this, we conclude our prepared remarks and will now hand back to Ravi to commence the Q&A session. Thank you, Rohit, uh, and thank you, Rish. With this, we will now move to the Q&A session. We request you to kindly restrict the number of questions to a maximum of two uh, at pointed times. In case you have further questions, feel free to join the queue again. In addition to audio, our participants do have an option to post the questions through the web uh, option on your screen. We will take these questions just before we end. With that, I'll hand the call back to Nira to manage the Q&A session for us. Over to Nira. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may put RN1 on their question on telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you must press RN2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking the question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question is assembled. Participants, you must press RN1 to ask question. The first question is from the line of Abnish Roy from Nuama. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks uh, for the opportunity. Uh, my first question is on the skincare and uh, you have seen budget growth, which is good achievement. Uh, even Nika saw 20% growth in business. My question is uh, Is this uh, growth uh, sustainable? How is rural demand in skincare? general uh, rural slowdown, uh, is that impacting uh, your upgrade both in a way? And second is uh, you briefly alluded to the focus intervention in new demand is. Uh, do you elaborate uh, that more is a current AI and supposedly uh, smaller pieces of your uh, overall skincare business? So that uh, acting overall growth in a way? Uh, I agree, Shami, doing. Uh, thank you for the question. If I understand you well, um, you spoke to beauty uh, growth or skin. I, I, I can hear that very well. The first part. Yes, yes. Current color cosmetics budget growth. Uh, yeah, I think the we are uh, we are uh, we we feel very excited with uh, this category because we have a sort of great brands, uh, master brands that can stretch uh, across formats such as Lakme. Uh, ponds, uh, to name a few, Indulekha, which is another rising star, and of, and of course, Blue and Lovely. 
we have a high relative market share, so we feel confident in the standard consumer. We have uh, brands stretching across the price pyramid, and we have extended all our brands now into new growth spaces and into new formats, uh, such as uh, Suncare, for instance, uh, as benefits or even new formats like Seasons, for argument's sake. So we we are uh, we've been mapping the market. Uh, we uh, also have already seeded and seen some promise in brands such as Simple, which is uh, mainly a face wash brand but has an, uh, a full portfolio. So we are uh, also therefore innovating quite aggressively uh, in this market. You spoke of uh, a Nike. A, a Nike, of course, is uh, you know we are going faster uh, than this number uh, at port in that platform and. I think Lakme is one of the top three brands in that platform, if I'm not wrong. So we feel very excited about this category. This category is, uh, has a virtuously strong growth rate, higher profit profile, uh, where we have both technology, R&D, and brand uh, assets. So in some substance, this is really an exciting space, and you should see more and more of our, our effort going in this direction. When we spoke to the high growth demand spaces, there are two parts of the market. Of course, we have high growth demand spaces, frankly, in all categories that we play in because we are in India, which is, you know, a great market to be in where this promise of great future because the per, per, per capita consumption are so low compared to other markets that each and every category we play in, we are in a broad sphere of categories, you know, are going to go through their S curves. We've shown we can play that S curve, for instance, in home care with liquids uh, that we have done or fabric conditioners. Similarly, we see S-curve opportunity and new demand spaces, but we are particularly excited about uh, new demand spaces in beauty and in foods, uh, packaged foods where uh, there's a lot more new benefits and new consumer habits and new ways of shopping, uh, such as for digital commerce that are beginning to take place. So I, I'm, I'm ho hoping this gives you a pretty good flavor of how we're thinking about uh, this entire uh, uh, space. Uh, thanks, Rohit. Uh, that was useful. And on my question on uh, rural demand in uh, at, uh, that was slow uh, uh, earlier quarters, and really rural is slow in most FMC. So, how are you seeing in this part of the business in rural? Uh, maybe I asked Ritesh to join in. I mean, he has really been uh, studying rural and the trends and patterns, and I think he'll probably give you a much more uh, richer answer. Uh, so obviously, it the rural question. See, overall, if I just look at the number, rural in this quarter, I'm just talking volume growth because we know price growth overall in FMCG has come down from the peak of 14% as an in industry uh, to 3% in this quarter. And uh, expectation, of course, is that we further get moderated going forward when the pricing actions that all the players are doing. But for a minute, I just focus on volume growth of rural. So rural volumes grew at 8% this quarter as, as market and in FMCG. And uh, same period last year, uh, we know that overall market had declined. So when overall market grew at 8 percentage, uh, this quarter market had declined by 6 percentage same period last year. So overall, when I look at total market, it is, it is grown at 1 percent over two years CAGR. If I double click within that rural, rural for this quarter grew at 7 percentage, but on a back of 9 percent decline in period last year. This is on a two year period, uh, two year CAGR average, Rural has still not fully recovered the volume it had before. It's a minus one percentage. But the good news is the minus one two-year CAGR now is better than what we saw minus four percent CAGR uh, previous quarter, June quarter. So we have seen gradual recovery coming, albeit on a small pace. Now, of course, the single biggest factor which is supporting rural uh, recovery is inflation moderating. It leads to more disposable income and hence more amount of expenditure is incurred uh, in, in FMCG for that matter. Real rural wages, uh, we all know that overall the wage inflation has always been higher for last many quarters now in urban compared to rural, but uh, we also have seen that real rural wages have now started to get into some positive territory, which again in my mind is a good news. Government has continued its thrust on rural. So the heightened amount of expansion in rural and investment for last few years, it has been maintained. And on top of that, uh, we know also that after agriculture, the second most important area where rural people get jobs is construction. And hence, with the entire capex getting tied up, that should start showing more impact in rural. 
Now, of course, there are watchouts. We know that overall job participation is increasing, and you also saw the uh, the uh, Mandrega demand. Uh, in fact, the Mandrega demand is higher than 2019, and uh, equally, monsoon has been uneven uh, against a long period average. There's a percent deficit on monsoon, and uh, also the reserve levels as uh, as we are exiting the uh, monsoon season. So that will have some amount of knock on impact. Uh, as we, as the, as the Kharif crop gets uh, harvested and as we get sold. So overall, if I summarize, we, we are cautiously optimistic and we expect demand to continue to recover gradually. So that's our overall read on rural. So thanks. Uh, your lovely wishes are, you know, because rural brand is also showing better uh, outcomes uh, recently, which is also very encouraging. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, my second and uh, last question is on the of small players slide report and just two uh, sub parts first is on t now t has not seen uh, too much of deflation and normally local players uh, come back when there is a sharp deflation so when you have said that players are growing 1.6 of the uh and india players uh what is driving this is when i see five percent decline in your fnr business the I'm getting is your tea business would have seen a sharper decline. So correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong there. And second, in uh, for the national tea uh, consumers, really they are far more sticky to those. Uh, so your customer will be he may uh, down in your brands, but it happens that there will be a almost seven eight percent kind of a decline in your tea volume. Uh, he out of your uh, brands and he goes to regional brands and what's driving that? Yeah, so, so let, let, me, let me kick off uh, and then uh, we'll hand over to you. So overall, uh, uh, it's, it's a good area to spend some time, uh, Ablish. So and again, it's only not only what has happened in this quarter, just important to see last four to six quarter what has happened to T. So T, all of us know, had significant inflation and followed by that, uh, it prices started to come down. And in fact, uh, a point in time, the commodity, your and Jerry's also declined. Uh, in this period, what has happened, Second factor apart from commodity volatility is also decoupling of loose tea, which is basically planar tea, the commodity, and the premium tea. The planar tea had seen more amount of price moderation because of a better crop compared to premium tea, again I'm talking commodity, which had seen little more inflation compared to the planar tea. So in effect what has happened, the price table between the planar tea and premium tea has widened. When this widens, so planar tea, which is what by and large the loose tea players end up using, and premium tea will have over-indexed consumption into our tea market. You have seen some amount of divergence and decoupling of the commodity trend. Now, in the overall context of inflation to start with, not only tea, I'm seeing overall inflation, the price in the last three years in FMCG, consumers have seen 25% inflation in the last three years. So that has had an impact where tea was the first category where we saw consumers downgrading on grading more towards loose tea and hence smaller uh, uh, players. Within our own portfolio, exactly to your point, we've seen more amount of, let me say, traction to Taza compared to premium teas. The market overall has also moved towards uh, loose tea and downgraded. That has had an impact. That's one. Second, your, of course, question was overall FNR. Uh, and of course, if I, if I look at the business that we have, our business sits between HA, uh, HFD and T. And uh, both uh, in HFT as well, uh, the point that you mentioned earlier, we have seen daily inflation, which is why our growth in HFD is price less and we have seen volume decline uh, because of high amount of prices and hence we had to increase our prices though judiciously. Similarly for coffee, coffee has seen 60 to 70 percent price inflation. I am saying commodity inflation over the last two years. Again, because of that, the growth that we have in coffee is a price-led growth with, uh, with those volumes have got impacted on consumption because of the impact of high inflation. So if you look at FNR portfolio, be it tea downgrading, be it HFD uh, price increase, or be for that matter coffee, these are the reasons why volumes in FNR overall have got impacted. Sure. Uh, my tough part, and this is my last question. Uh, so essentially on detergent bar, you have mentioned detergent. Uh, the issue is you have given a very stark data. 6Y versus Y looks like a very stark data. So give some real numbers to understand better, have a better understanding. At the outer mass end, there also would you have seen local players grow much faster just like fast? Yeah. 
So, so the point of this that we quoted, uh, you know, we used two examples, and of course, there are parts of the portfolio, especially as mass end, at those price points in certain geographies is what we have seen this behavior, and which, of course, two examples we quoted out of that, which is detergent bar and tea. And uh, in, this, in these cases, as commodity softened, we have seen resurgence of many small players. And which is why at an aggregate market level, uh, these players have uh, grown ahead of the large players. And of course, as you know, we, have, we, have a, we are market leaders uh, in these categories. So as, as this development happens, it has impacted to us in markets where our market share has seen a dip. So something very similar we had also captured in our last quarter's narrative, and we've seen that consistently playing out. So of course, this reality, it is, again, if I just go back to a little more longer history, 2015, 2008, when we saw this happening for skin cleansing, 2012, 13 happening for tea, uh, laundry, 13, 14 happening for tea. In each of these periods, we have seen this behavior where when commodity price goes up, after that it comes down, volume recovery takes some time to happen. And we do have seen this behavior where uh, we see small players who basically vacate the market, the commodity is extremely volatile and they start participating in the market when commodity becomes benign. And for some point in time, like everything else in life, uh, these are cyclical in nature in terms of commodity, and as price table stabilizes, the market, market equilibrium gets established. And uh, that's all from Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nish. Thank you. Next question is from the line of M from Jeffries India. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, team. Uh, two questions. So my first question is on uh, the slide on uh, market share. Uh, uh, so where, where you have mentioned, let's say 60% of the portfolio is winning value share, whereas over 75% is winning volume share. With all that you have explained, uh, you know, I'm still not able to understand why would that be the case. So, you know, I would have thought value share would have been, you know, portfolio gaining value share would have been higher than volume share that there is the competition at the bottom and uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Why why is, why is do you think there is this disconnect between the two? Yeah, I think let, let, let me pick it up, uh, this question, uh, Vivek. So uh, I think very similar to what I just mentioned, you know, with soft input cost, small players growing at mass and faster than the larger player. And remember, as, as Hindustan Unilever, we are over-indexed on premium portfolio. And hence, when the mass end of the market becomes larger because in certain markets like this with growth, it leads to value volume disparity in short term. As we're transitioning this inflationary period. Uh, and I quoted the example, uh, Vivek of tea. You know, take uh, loose tea, take Aza, and take premium tea. As the market is overall downgrading, in our case as well, Aza, for example, which again is at the lower end of the price, we'll see more better growth compared to, let's say, premium tea. So hence, overall, when you look at portfolio, which is over indexed on premium compared to industry, if mass is growing with higher weightage, this is the volume value disconnect which you get in short period. Uh, if you look at our volume shares, more than 75% portfolio is gaining volume share. And, we, and these are the pockets where you see the volume value disconnect leading to uh, about 60% value share gain. But this is really the volume value disconnect in short period as market tables of pricing are getting stabilized and as this demand curves are getting into transition and getting stabilized. Okay, so that's very right, Ritesh. What uh, uh, I mean, when when there is a when there is a you know let's say at the bottom is going faster, so you are still, while that is happening, you are still gaining market share, but just the value overall value gets impacted. See, typically as as Hindustan Unilever, uh, you know, we call it three times out. Uh, for us, mix. Remember, our UVG feature is volume and mix. Mix is usually a, a, a factor which is accretive. In these times where the mix changes a little bit in categories like uh, my example I quoted on detergent bar, example I'm quoting of C, when the competition happens, I'm saying the overall value per ton which industry sells comes down. And which is the mix impact then you end up seeing, and which is why then you end up seeing a volume value disconnect. Okay. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, the second thing is, the uh, second question is for uh, Rohit. So this is first, uh, you know, conference call where you are addressing what an actual is, you know, is, you know, always considered to be, you know, gold standard. But what are the areas? So we know all the positives, but, you know, Rohit, what are the key focus areas from a near to medium term perspective that you are talking about at this point of time? Thank you, Vic. Excellent uh, uh, question. And 
you know, I'm only thinking about HUL day and night uh, for some time now, and I think, firstly, what I'm really impressed, and I have said this before in the last uh, in other interactions, that we fundamentally a very, very robust business. Uh, uh, and I, I talked about in my presentation the reason I feel inspired and excited to, uh, you know, be a part of this business today for, uh, you know, all its deep strength. When I look closely at even our operational health and all indicators, in the moment, uh, you know, I see that we have a very high, uh, large part of our portfolio is growing penetration, which is a good sign. We have our product quality being superior than competitive benchmarks, more like 60% in buying, which is very good of turnover. We have increasing assortment. Our uh, distributor strength is strong in holding. Uh, we, in fact, doing very well in some parts of uh, rural areas like Shakti, where we're seeing um, sustained growth. Uh, we also have a, a strong brands and large majority of brands are growing brand power. There are, of course, a few fixes to be done. So on the whole, portfolio is strong. That said, when you look at the my most important uh, um, emphasis going forward, and I try to cover that in what I call the key thrust chart, that there are, there are parts of our strategy that must be continued because they are appropriate for the opportunity you're seeing. As I mentioned to you that the Indian uh, market is at, at a point of inflection. I feel it's like 10, 15 years behind China, uh, where I worked some uh, for some years, as you know. I see similar trends, although, of course, they're not exactly the same, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, the uh, big growth in affluence that one can see already in, uh, you know, income, uh, high-income households sort of doubling every five years. So you see the opportunity of the digital and the hard infrastructure that's trading for uh, for uh, consumers to access brands, both, uh, you know, how they, how they consume brand uh, uh, messages and of either brands. And also, of course, uh, the way brands are built is changing as well because social, for instance, has become a big deal uh, in India already, uh, whether it's rural or, or urban because of the deep access to, for instance, cell phones and YouTube and platforms such as those. Uh, there's, of course, uh, fragmentation. Uh, one can see in channels, but also in benefit segments. And, and yet, you know, there's every category we're in is going to go through an S-curve, is going through an S-curve of growth. And I'm particularly excited with taking the strengths we have forward and then evolving some more be ready for the future. So as I mentioned to you, my priority is in the moment, and we will sharpen them as we go along in at some stage uh, in a few months, I would like to give you more deep color of what it means for us uh, and what changes it means for us. But for sure, the first thing is to drive and forward the strategy that's working and shape it for the future. So as I mentioned to you, it's a, for me very crystal clear that our big 19 or 20 brands, more than 1,000 crores, will have to be the first engine of growth and our strength in making sure they're superior in execution end-to-end across our 16 clusters of winning in many Indias is the first disciplined capability I need to keep repeating. The second is uh, market development, which we have shown we can do a great job within particularly home care with fabric conditions, liquids. We replicate that in shower gels, for instance, and we replicate that in face wash and so on and so forth. Uh, we will see that is a repeatable model that we need to exercise more widely, especially for more premium formats, uh, whether it's benefit segments of sun care or the new formats such as serums, we have identified uh, a certain set of market development bets we will stay multi year committed to. But number three is transforming two specific parts of portfolio where we believe we can do better in terms of coverage. Although we have a very good portfolio which you know fills uh, the price pyramid, but I think beauty care and food. And I mean packaged foods are two areas where we can actually leverage our big brands and in fact bring in new brands, including from Unilever, to uh, stretch and fill all new demand spaces. That's what I meant by, you know, open demand spaces. And finally, uh, second to last is this whole area of money in channels. And we're very strong in general trade and we have an above average fair share in modern trade. But, you know, there's a new ways in which consumers are shopping, they're shopping in 
uh, uh, e-commerce like Nike, you, you know, one of our colleagues mentioned, Abhinesh, or the shopping and quick commerce, uh, which is uh, happening now as well. And of course, Amazon's and Flipkart's uh, customers such as those or others are also going to be established. So e-commerce, quick commerce, and of course, our B2B uh, strength through the Shutter app, which is an amazing asset, amazing asset, which we will actually leverage and make it a, a, even a deeper moat. So I think digitally selling to our customers and consumers and also building strength in new channels such as quick commerce and pharma, really an opportunity we will, uh, we will not let go. And finally, we have this um, very good, strong muscle of frugality and operational tightness. We call it symphony fuel for growth. So while our valuation with the creation is more driven by top line, we do want to inch up at you know, the margin and create fuel for growth. And that's why you see us we will continue driving our repeatable uh, model on Symphony, which is our end-to-end P&L, squeeze out productivity, and we're going to take it to the next level. So we can generate big funds that can go behind, uh, you know, a big BMI or ANP that we need to fight all of these opportunities. And all of this, I want to really reinforce some uh, existing strengths like Remy and take it to the next level. In digital, we are, uh, as I mentioned, Shikhar. We're also going to look at what we can do around consumer and the operation and more details on this later. So our reimagining agenda taking forward. Sustainability, we are going to focus even more on things like net zero, plastics, water, and community, of course. And we will build a culture. Uh, we have a great culture of uh, leadership, of discipline, of rigor, of, of being uh, thought leaders. We will make sure that our scale uh, becomes an advantage and they become a, a big and fast. So scale insurgent, uh, even going forward, then we can, uh, you know, make, uh, 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 take, take intelligent risks. We will, uh, we have already 16 clusters. We have 16 small category teams. Each of them can be an operating unit, independent, are on their own. So creating that entrepreneurship and empowerment so that we can really collectively move very, very fast uh, and really tap all these opportunities culturally as well. Be something that I'll be working on to take to the next level. So I don't know if it gives you a good flavor, but this is the sort of thing, thing that we are thinking of as a team, and we're sharpening our agenda and making sure that we sort of evolve uh, this agenda for the next phase of HUL's growth journey. This, I hope it gave you a good sense of both the heart and the mind of really where our uh, agenda is for HUL. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. That was a really good response. So wishing you all the very best. Thanks, Vic. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Mitra from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my first question was actually a little bit on the near term outlook. Uh, so I think last couple of quarters you mentioned a few factors uh, in the channel, price cut, uh, some price of local competition. This quarter, of course, there's a lot of festive uh, timing issue. What do, uh, do we believe now that? Behind or that we adjust the pipeline and allow small players versus large players is something that continue for some more time. And uh, in the similar line, uh, does it really matter for FCG, if yes, I mean, if you have some flavor of how much is the impact of the timing? Yeah, Ritesh, if you could just pick this up for Anna, please. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, uh, Anna, uh, let me just talk about uh, uh, the output for volume to start with. I think uh, long term, Rohit talked extremely uh, comprehensively about uh, what drives FMCG and what are the kind of opportunities and the long uh, highway for growth of the category, and of course, us as industry reliever. If I just zoom, zoom in now to short term, uh, there are factors which are supporting continued volume recovery. Uh, we had called it out that we will see, in post this high inflationary period, a gradual recovery in volumes. And uh, what are the factors we're supporting? Three of them A, inflation is moderating. Uh, and the full impact in this quarter, as we speak, uh, in laundry and skin printing, we have taken uh, sequential price reductions, uh, which is why at an overall aggregate level, you saw uh, HUL had uh, roughly flat price growth in this quarter. Uh, FMCG industry, as per Nielsen data, is still showing 3% price, which the point I had mentioned earlier, that uh, it takes uh, basically a quarter or so for it to stabilize and start reflecting what manufacturers are being at. Uh, so consumers will start seeing the impact of deflation as you start seeing the price growth going away. Uh, that's number one. Second is the upcoming festival season. Of course, there are, uh, uh, as you know, the phasing of festival, 
this time, all the days of festival lands in December quarter. Unlike last year, when there were some days of festival which came in September quarter, and of course a larger part of days came in December quarter. This time we have all days coming into December quarter. So with inflation moderating, higher disposable income in uh, in hands of consumers, urban leading growth overall in the industry for FMCG for now, and urban income uh, more resilient and having seen better wage inflation, uh, we see that again as a third factor which is helping. Uh, in short term for volume recovery. Uh, of course, as, as an economy, we know that between growth, inflation, and currency, uh, the country has done an excellent job in managing the three vectors very well. So we have, on the back of it, a resilient economy. Watch out, uh, equally like support factors, uh, in my mind, will be three. Uh, a monsoon, we all discussed uh, uh, the kind of uneven monsoon we had and the potential impact of that that could have in uh, rural. And uh, second, of course, is global commodity prices. Uh, as we speak, uh, is forming up, uh, and it's more than 90 uh, as we speak, and uh, with uh, geopolitical stability uh, again being questioned, and as all of us know what's happening this time around, uh, those factors put together are, in my mind, a short-term uh, watch out. So, hence, in summary, uh, post a high inflation period, gradual recovery should, in our view, continue, and which is why we are cautiously optimistic uh, and equally confident of gradual volume recovery. So that's, I would say, in short term is our uh, view uh, where it is. Uh, from uh, a pricing perspective, uh, we had called out in our commentary that uh, if a commodity prices remain where they are, we'll see marginally negative price growth uh, going ahead. Uh, so, Ritik, just to clarify, so, so the channel talking component and this competition versus national competition, uh, that large time in your view, or there is a little bit more of it that's required, given you know where you the market. Yeah, uh, the sure. rest of the points, sure. of course, are uh, are there, but these two are behind now. Yeah. So let me first pick up the channel players. So um, the channel inventory overall, I, I think since uh, at least if I talk about Hindustan Unilever, uh, with all the commodity that have got moderated, they have finished doing a pricing action this quarter. And uh, uh, as an industry, I think the same thing happens, which is the 3% price growth, which Nielsen shows, moves to zero, I think by next quarter, we should all be uh, uh, set square. So, so I think that transition, in my mind, uh, should get done, unless we end up seeing more amount of commodity volatility, which brings a new story altogether. So since that, I think we should get stabilized next quarter, number one. Move to the small player, uh, of course, uh, this is something which uh, is, again, very much linked to the commodity cycle. Again, as commodity cycle starts to stabilize, uh, in our mind, the price equilibrium will start get to uh, uh, stabilize. Because job there would be, of course, overall demand scenario, and uh, demand scenario across different price point. If market does not continue to downgrade, for example, in tea, or for it matter, small players at a mass end, example, in laundry bars, uh, that behavior will have to change uh, for this equilibrium to be equal. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we've seen in the past this happens, and then in, in few quarters, it starts to then go back to the same equilibrium of competitiveness across the price point as it always is. So, yeah, so in our, in our view, it's a uh, short term couple of quarters. So, thanks, that's uh, very helpful. Uh, my second and last question was on HFD. So, uh, you, you explained uh, the sector as well as you can. Obviously, you put in a huge amount of effort on every line of what would have done to grow that business. Uh, in, in truth, what you see in other companies is wherever there is very high price growth, volumes are subdued, but revenue growth are very high. I think this should be one of the categories where even the revenue growth is about mid single bit a lot of pricing. Um, so my question really was that, uh, could it really be a structural issue where consumers who are reducing consumption are doing it for other reasons of other sources of nutrition? Are you there's something uh, that gives you confidence that this is purely a milk inflation related issue and uh, therefore, you know, once stability is achieved, there, uh, you should the volume become. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. No, no, I, I, I just, I think the, if you look at, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, benchmark market, you know, for similar categories in Southeast Asia, the size and scale of uh, such brands uh, is very, very strong. And given that the HFT category is still uh, penetration levels are low, uh, and we are actually fully, you know, uh, we have basically uh, South and East 
<clears throat> and we have north and west still to go to, the, the headspace on Caribbean should be very, very long. And apart from the fact that it's got this market development uh, uh, runway, this is also a category which is good for the country, and that's why we like it so much because it helps address the malnutrient uh, gap that exists within uh, our society. So, given that for these two reasons, this is definitely a long-term bet. Now, it's it is possible that no, know that for a fact that. Consumers have down trade, uh, have titrated the consumption because the cost of each cup has had gone up, and we start to see already in the last few quarters as, as milk prices have stabilized, uh, and we have focused our communication on why you know this category makes sense, why it's so important, and we have started customizing our communication as well, different regions. We have stabilized our assortment uh, and our whole uh, set of curves on our SQs. We start to see uh, green shoots. Secondly, there's also a big opportunity in the premium end of this uh, category, which is in the space of uh, science-based supplements that are focused on adults, on women, women's health, uh, and so on and so forth. And those those are doing quite well. And we have a low share in that segment, so there's also an opportunity to do that uh, is to grow there. And then, of course, Holix and Boost. And Boost, by the way, is doing very well. It's already in the double-digit uh, levels. We do see an opportunity for as well to also stretch these brands, um, you know, leveraging their strong equity. So I see many levers, uh, like we said in the chart, more uh, users, more usage, and more premium. Uh, many, many more opportunities to draw this uh, category and take it to the next level. It's already a scale category for us, from almost 500 million uh, euro or uh, in scale. So yeah, I think. I'm optimistic, but we need to stay disciplined and patient and keep working for the long term. Okay, thanks so much, Rohit, for your clarification. Uh, That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Aurora from ICA Production. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, I just had one question uh, with respect to your ANC expenditure. Given the uh, sharp growth, uh, uh, year over year, I just want to understand characteristics uh, of this picture in case as well as current year LP in terms of how much would be advertising and how much towards promotion. And with an advertising, how much be led towards digital media and uh, uh, the digital media? No, no, thanks, Jitendra, for the question. Uh, so, we are, so, this quarter, as you've seen our results, uh, we have 11.4% ANP uh, expenses. Uh, same period last year we had 7.2%, and which is why you see a pretty strong 420 BPS year on year increase in ANP expenses, which is 700 crore and a 65% increase. Now, uh, of course, to some extent, it's a base. And uh, remember again, September quarter, period last year, it was the peak of inflation, and, and hence overall GRC in the industry had come down, uh, where there's a much higher price versus cost gap in the industry. And on that low base uh, uh, of last year, same time, uh, when you compare 11.4, looks a substantial increase. But even if I ignore the base, if you just look at the overall full year number, same period last year, 8.4% 8 was our annual uh, ANP. And that ANP number we have gradually kept increasing from 7.2 to 8 to 8.8, 9.9, .9, and then 11.4 in the current quarter. Now, for us, what are the principles for ANP resource allocation? It, the first ground principle is share of voice ahead of share of market. That determines the amount of intensity, A, competitive intensity, and basis that the amount of allocation that you want to do for resource. Second, of course, your reach objective, and your frequency objective, which is the amount of innovation that you want to land in the market. That's the second driver which then determines the absolute amount of ANP investment which you end up doing. Uh, suffice to say, where we are at 11, little over 11%, between 11 to 12, uh, that's the kind of a benchmark at some stage we had pre-inflation. And uh, the way I see, uh, this number will remain firm. Uh, given the amount of competitive, competitive intensity, this number will remain firm. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ritesh, but uh, that does not address my question. I just wanted to understand the characteristic of this rather than uh, why it has grown. Yeah. So in terms of characteristics, if I look, see, overall, when we look at our total, let me say, 100 pi, to your question, one third is digital media, two third is traditional media. Uh, so that's how we typically split up expenses. Now, to your other question, sub-question, is it promotion-driven? It is advertising-driven? It is advertising-driven. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Next question is from the line of Mohammed Rustaki from BS Group. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, team. Thanks for being my question. Hi. I have just one question on the scale of for uh, uh, three to seven or three to nine. I do think that uh, our uh, increased ANT trend will lead to uh, on a higher volume growth uh, for the second half of the year. Yes. Uh, sorry, you did not get a question. Uh, can you please uh, come again, please? Yeah, so, like I'm saying, how confident we are on a scale of 110 that how uh, volume growth we can drive the uh, second half of the year with increased ANT trend. And uh, when cross margins are going to stay here, uh, so, are we going to continue with a higher ANP spend in the coming quarter as well? Yeah. So, let me take the second question first. And I, I think the first question you're trying to ask is the outlook that we have a volume going ahead. So, that's clear. See, uh, uh, of course, the job that uh, we have, which is to keep driving our reflex muscles and generating overall symphony savings, the program that we use internally in the organization called Symphony, where our objective always is to drive savings across all the lines of the PL, eat promotions be it advertising, be it supply chain cost, or for that matter, overhead cost. Uh, some portion of that gives benefit in gross margin. Other element uh, of the lines of the PNL also get benefit of the overall savings program that we drive. Uh, that effort of driving savings across all lines of the PNL will continue. And uh, to Rohit's earlier articulation, we'll only further step it up uh, with, with uh, full intention to ensure that we're able to invest it back in the business. Invest it back in terms of ensuring competitive levels of expansion of ANP, which, as I mentioned, will remain firm. Uh, uh, how we read, uh, invest it back in terms of capability building. Uh, when we do shikhar, when we do reimagine HUL, uh, they all require investments to get done, and that's how then we generate sources to invest in business. And uh, and see, of course, uh, invest back in terms of uh, product superiority, and invest back in terms of overall portfolio development. So. The job of generating resources within the PNL and deploying to drive growth, and that, uh, that cycle will continue to do. So that's how we look at when we look at the financial growth model is to keep looking for sources of uh, uh, investment, and then of course uh, areas that we need to invest to drive growth. And then coming back to outlook is what I was responding earlier. Uh, we have seen uh, gradual recovery of demand as uh, high inflation periods are stabilizing, and uh, as we mentioned that in summary, we remain cautiously optimistic in terms of this gradual recovery of demand uh, as a high inflationary period is uh, hopefully behind us and we have a more stable uh, outlook going forward in terms of commodity and hence uh, part of that in terms of positive impact of that on the demand uh, generation uh, overall in the industry. So, yeah, but I, I know you would love to hear a number from me, uh, but uh, I can only tell you qualitatively uh, what are the factors as I was responding earlier, uh, which we see in short term driving and supporting the growth and uh, be it uh, overall inflation coming down, be it overall festival demand or the resilient economy that we have. And of course, the factors I did call out between monsoon, uh, volatile commodity and geopolitical stability, which are the factors which might uh, work against this, this recovery is happening. We will of course see when all these things put together, we will see how, how demand situation turns out. But the overall aggregate narrative is uh, cautiously optimistic with uh, continued recovery of demand outlook. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Thanks, team. Yeah. Thank you. This question is from the line of Kunal Vora from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So my first question is on pricing. At a portfolio level, how much price cut have you taken from the peak and uh, how many quarters the pricing could remain negative? And uh, the price cuts, uh, mostly, are they in value segment or are they broad based? Yeah, so uh, could I call out that the price in this quarter, uh, that we declared in the September quarter, there are categories uh, essentially where we have taken price decreases sequentially. Uh, number one, uh, we called out was cleansing, and second, we called out uh, uh, in the area of laundry stroke detection. Uh, of course, as I mentioned uh, earlier to another question, there are also areas where we have also increased prices, uh, be it coffee, be it HFD, uh, where we have seen input cost inflation. Uh, now, of course, uh, as we speak, uh, to the extent where commodities are today and whatever near-term output we have, uh, as far as we are concerned, we have finished doing the job in terms of price adjustments that we had to do to our portfolio. This is why if commodities remain where they are in short term, now short term could be three months, four months, all depends as to where commodities end up settling in for a little longer period than a few months, all depends upon where commodities settles. At least in short term, we do see uh, our price growth be marginally negative if commodities remain where they are today.
Okay. And can you talk about your priority? Like, say, I mean, as the GM expands, uh, would you, like, you raise edge spends, but it looks like uh, price cuts don't seem to be very large. Uh, you also have increased event density. Uh, uh, high priority edge spends and not um, pass on some similar, especially with the competition. So we have both. Uh, you know, one of the factor uh, we had mentioned that you know, when you have such prices going up, coming down, the single most important priority is to ensure competitive price value equation of all of our products across the board. Equally, when the commodity price is going up, and hence we have to increase prices, or for that matter, when commodity cost comes down, we have to decrease prices. In fact, like, uh, our pricing principle has been when commodity cost goes up, we take price increases in smaller chunks. When commodity cost comes down, we take decrease in larger chunks so that you don't disrupt trade pipeline with frequent changes in pricing. So to the extent we had to take prices down judiciously, to ensure competitive price valuation, that job we have done. And of course, uh, as that has happened, and the bleed of price versus cost has come down, uh, which is uh, apart from everything else that we've done to drive cost down, is one of the reasons why we've seen uh, a pretty uh, good amount of gross margin recovery is back to a pre-inflation level uh, where we are today at uh, around 52 percentage. So, so that's what we have done in terms of a first port of call has been to ensure competitive price equation. And then as we needed to invest money behind ANP, competitively, with the principle of share of voice ahead of share of market is what we've done. But again, that doesn't mean that other elements of jobs to be done in terms of investing in product to drive product superiority, investing in capability like Shikhar, Reimagine HUL, as we kept doing, or for that matter, dialing up more amount of innovation that we want to bring to the marketplace. We spoke this quarter, we were very busy with PPC, with uh, good amount of innovation across the board that we've landed. So the resources then which get generated in the PNL, they get basically deployed in all of these priorities to drive all around growth and business development. Uh, sorry to continue on, like uh, when intensity has increased significantly, you have like say portfolio is gaining less market share, why not just uh, take larger price cuts? Uh, when like, why have 700 margin expansion over the last one year and like, that could have been reinvested a bit more in pricing? Uh, no, of course, uh, uh, it's, it's a very uh, complex set of decisions and you can imagine business decisions are very complex. The way you deploy your entire six from development to uh, deployment, pricing, to promotion, product, and this entire 60 mix, we have to always look what will give us a competitive edge in the market. And it can never be a unidimensional uh, view that that price will get more growth, uh, only if uh, life was so simple. Just one last point. Uh, historically, has elections uh, had any impact on uh, the growth rates? Uh, how do you see the elections coming in? See, uh, 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 you know, we have seen, I think, our read over the last uh, several years in this case has been the structural interventions that the government has. Uh, be it, example, we spoke on last couple of years of uh, heightened amount of capital expenditure that government has had, or for that matter, when you contain inflation, when infra spend goes up, we've seen those long-term measures have a higher impact on FMCG demand, uh, and because A, they drive disposable income, uh, they, they drive better amount of jobs, and hence they also drive more amount of money being available. Spend. So our read has been that those macro factors developed and deployed by government has larger impact on FMCG demand. So that's where we see higher correlation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are at 7.30. Uh, so we will end the session here. Uh, before we end, let me remind you that the playback of this event is available, will be available on the Investor Relations website uh, in a short while from now. Uh, if there are further questions, feel free to reach out to any of us in the IR team, and we'll be happy to address them. Uh, once again, thanks for the participation, and uh, have a great evening ahead. Thank you so much for all your engagement. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of Hindustan Unilever Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now discuss lines. Thank you. <laughs> Let's take an exit.